Ja, ik we zijn nog live. I think we're live. Are we live? I think so. Are we? Well, where's the... Are we visible? Yeah. We're visible. Hi, hi. Living room stream for winning. <laughs> How's the audio quality? Can everybody hear as well? Can you hear us, guys? Here's, by the way. All good, all good. Here you're fine. Cheers. Audio quality is fine. Good night, fellas. Cheers. Wow. So choo choo, homies. How do you do? <laughs> Loud and clear, very charming. Okay. Um. Oh, so no what's the? Don't turn on off notification. So what's the idea? What is the idea? What is the idea? What's the idea? Q and A. Yeah, I mean, does anyone have any uh, any questions? Questions. It's Q and A day, guys. Yeah. I want to turn off the notifications. I'm not sure why. Watch notifications. We have a question about C wave. I don't see it. Where is it? Would you ever write your own C-Wave integration over the open C-Wave stuff because that's rather weak compared to Habitat or more commonly smart things? Well, the thing is, is that like it's not easy to write a C-Wave integration. So like the thing, the stuff the open C-Wave people did is really good, um, but. Uh, we're using these Python bindings on top of them, which is not good. It makes it super complicated to build and maintain. And right now it's behind the official Open Z-Wave uh, stuff. And so we actually, I mean, I announced this on the, at the State of the Union, but we're working with Fish Waldo, which is like the lead of the Open Z-Wave project. To, he's creating like an Open Z-Wave to MQTT, which sends the raw signals from Open Z-Wave. And we are having a, MQTT to Python library that is like processing all those messages. And I mean, there's progress being made and we're getting close to like a read-only version, uh, but it means you have to rebuild the whole Z-Wave integration. Um, so that's one thing we're working on. We're also working on other angles. So I'm actually, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, Denmark for uh, next week. Um, Cause my, my wife's from Denmark and visiting family. But I'm also gonna stop by at Silicon Labs in Copenhagen, and they uh, maintain Z-Wave. They're like the, the chip manufacturer, or they bought it actually. Um, and I'm gonna talk to the team there, I'm gonna present about Home Assistant, I'm gonna make the case for uh, them better caring about open source. Because right now, obviously, there's not a good uh, way for open source to hook into the Z-Wave world. Because at the end of the day, I mean, they maintain official drivers that is like officially maintained, and that's something like, why can't we use it? If we buy Z-Wave chips, we should be able to use Z-Wave drivers. So yeah. that's what I'm gonna try to convince them of. So we'll see. They're um, asking for a timeline though. A timeline, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is open source. So um, no, I think the, the read-only version of the MQTT one is pretty close to like, the Python library is pretty close to being functional. 
for read only, and then we can work on the integration. Um, Charles is working on it, so I cannot like promise a timeline <coughs> for him. Obviously, it's also holiday season, so um, yeah. But I can, I mean, I can post the repo. I think uh, I did it last uh, before, but I'll. It's progressing pretty well. Let me just. Uh, I hope you can paste it though. I can just. I think you can paste. You're not an app now, I guess. No, I can just. It's blocked. Uh, but we'll see. Oh, well, awkward. Okay. Oh, I like that one. Biggest face problem that you have encountered during the development of Home System? Grab. Uh, uh, enough. <laughs> <laughs> My, my, my first experience with, with Home Assistant uh, development and with Frank, mostly, <laughs> <laughs> it uh, was a good, uh, good uh, meeting. Well, I, we did uh, the, the Lovelace uh, uh, configuration in the front end. Oh, that one. And we thought awesome. it was a good idea to, to uh, add Storage IDs YAML. to our storage, you know, to our YAML or Lovelace YAML. Yeah. Not everyone agreed no. with uh, that idea. I didn't. <laughs> so, in the end, it, uh, it worked out. Frank came with a good solution. And okay. so, it worked out in the end. Yeah. And then, yeah. Hi, what a lovely atmosphere. Christmas atmosphere. It's almost Christmas time, right? I mean, once it's past Santa Claus, right? Then past Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me put some fire on the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. If you could be any animation or script, what kind of animation or script would you be? In what, what color? color? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Orange, of course. Orange. <laughs> Why? We're in Holland. Ah, oh, okay. IMG Orange. No, it could be any automation. I mean, it would be like sleeping in automation. So like a <laughs> <laughs> sunrise plus three hours. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh. Are you okay? Yep. All fine. No. All the bloopers are live too, huh? Yeah. It's almost hard to recognize Frank without a hat. Okay. Can okay. <laughs> fix that. That's. Oh my God. Man, I need to zoom in. I can hardly read all this stuff. I'm in the front room. Hat fixed. There you go. There you go. Hat fixed. I'm a developer of an app that provides a touch friendly control for home assistant called Haskip. Haskip. Yeah, it's like a Flutter-based app for yeah. iOS and uh, Android. Android. Cool. Yeah. John Blair, love HA, but it's hard to integrate with Alexa. Is it? It's not. I mean, with Home Assistant Cloud, it's just a click. But, yeah, I think he tries to do it without a cloud. Right. Well, that's, yeah. That's hard. That's harder. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, really that's hard. why we added it to the cloud. <laughs> that's why we have the cloud stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Scroll back up, you're missing questions. Yeah. Oh boy. What did we miss? I know. Will, there ever, will there ever come a customer ready hardware device? Uh, you know, the thing is, hardware is really hard and it's, it's just a pain. Plus, trying to compete with like Chinese manufacturers is hard. And I know, there's just a lot of things against hardware. Like, it's really, really difficult. It's like, it has to work forever. <laughs> Should not be our problem. Let's no, I, rather, I mean, I rather partner up with companies that want to provide hardware, but I think, I mean, I have this question again, it's all the time. And the biggest challenge is, is that Home Assistant itself has so many integrations, you can offer support for that. When people buy hardware, they want support. And so it has to be guaranteed to work. So it means you have to like, Create a subset of Home Assistant that has like certified partners, certified integrations. It will be really, really limited. It will be like a smart things kind of experience. So, oh boy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. okay. My questions. <laughs> My questions. <laughs> My questions. No. 
Oh boy. Thank you, Annie. I saw something else. About is that your new server box in the background with the AMD cooler stock cooler lights? Yeah, it is. Well spotted, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> My living room is study. Yeah. I guess. What do you say about the snip steak over from Sonos? Oh, that's just sad. I mean, it's a pity. I mean, they just take good technology off the market. It was. I mean, that's the biggest thing. It was like, I mean, there was still room to improve Snip stuff, but like, but just making it no longer accessible, no one can use it and no one can benefit from it. And I mean, we're working there. I don't know if people are aware of like, there, there's Raspi, which is like an open source, fully open source alternative to uh, Snips. It's pretty much a, a bits and pieces of a different open source projects tied together into like an experience that's very similar to, uh, to Snips. Uh, but also supports many more different languages um, and we're working on integrating that with like ADA and the conversation integration and um, I don't know when it's going to be live. There's a PR open but it's still kind of like finding out the right fit for it but that should uh, we I mean Raspi should be a proper SNPs uh, replacement. replacement yeah sure ninja food it's cheese by the way oh that's good Very broad question, but what's according to you the low hanging fruit to improve the WAF? Well, I mean, the, the partner <laughs> approval factor. Yeah, that's better. Um, I think, I mean, it really depends on how you use Home Assistant, right? Like, in an ideal world, you wouldn't use the Home Assistant user interface. Like, Home Assistant would kind of work in the background yeah. to help you live a better life and you could have maybe voice control or some buttons left and right to kind of do things. Um, and so just making it easier for people to create automations would actually be something that like would help make it easier, which I think we're actually, I mean, we're working on it with like device automations, really making it easier to create automations with less documentation reading and stuff. I think the best home automation is if, uh, when you don't notice it, like things just happen. You have no idea that it, that it is happening, like it's normal, like walk into a room and the light turns on. And right. Maybe, and maybe at night if you go on to the hallway and the light is like softer than normal. I think that's all like how you build it and not how Home Assistant provides this UI or its capabilities. The capabilities are already there. This is just how you build it. Yeah. I mean, the, the easier we make it for people to yeah. build, to use Home Assistant, I think that's where it's going to... True. Excel, because we, we have all the powerful features in place. Hmm. I guess so. Have you looked into Mozilla's open voice service? Yes. yes, we have. I've been actually, I mean, I met uh, uh, Joe Fish, who is like the principal scientist at Mozilla, a couple of like, I know, one and a half months ago at uh, Stanford. Um, and so he said that. Uh, text-to-speech part of Mozilla is able to run on a Raspberry Pi 4. <laughs> Although Frank did some investigation in it if he could like get like a, a Docker image, like a Haslio add-on ready. And it's still using TensorFlow, I think, right? Yeah, it's still TensorFlow. Yeah, it's and so... And it, and it actually prefers a, a GPU, which is just hard to do in an add-on. Right. Well, yeah, I think it was like, it took, yeah. wouldn't say like, it took two seconds or something? Two or three seconds for, uh, for a normal sentence. Yeah, it's a bit too, I mean, well, we're going to try, but if it's, if it's not fast enough, then the experience is so bad and like, it's like, what are we doing? But I mean, that's the problem actually with like text to speech and speech to text is that the, the big models are all based on like AI, TensorFlow, all that stuff and machine learning and it just doesn't run well on Raspberry Pis. TensorFlow is a big problem for me. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people say, but Snips could do it. But actually, I mean, Snips was a limited number of sentences. It's not like open speech to text. No. Yeah, absolutely Which... not. Oh, this one is for you, Brad. Will there be drag and drop into the face designer for Lawface? Uh, hopefully one day, yes. <laughs> but I mean, well, but drag and drop what? Because like rearranging the cards? That would be cool. But also, I love how Grafana does it. 
I right. just love how really I love how Grafana. Does. How does the Grafana deal with like changing between one, two, and three columns? Well, though? Yeah, that's, that's, that's easy because it's problem. no, yeah, that's our main problem for Grafana. Yeah. It's easy. It's just a graph. I'm smaller or whatever. Because but in our case, that's hard. I, that I, is I, hard because we do this. We have this kind of like algorithm that like first tries to fill up each column into like five heights, with five being around each five or forty eight pixels each kind of unit, and after that, we kind of like just fill it up. And mm -hmm. so that just becomes very difficult to like drag and drop because that's yeah. not how it's, it's already difficult now. Because if you move a card up now, it won't it necessarily go, go up. one up, it, 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 go it, one down. Down. it, it, it jumps all around because <laughs> yeah. yeah, it moves them up in the config, but the algorithm isn't necessarily the same as the config. Yeah. Sure so yeah, some challenges. I see one question pop up every time, so I'm going to answer that one. Uh, that's about WLED integration. How's it moving along? Adding effect speed and intensity. I've looked into it. I've not made it for uh, this release. I couldn't have made it, make it. And we're looking into, I don't know, I bumped in some corner where I think we should take a look at Home Assistant. Um, right. So probably the release of January, maybe. Right. Yeah, we're taking a two-week break after this release, 103, so 104 is due 14. 14th, yeah, the, we cut the beta on like the 8th or something. Yeah. Yep. Will Lovelace ever be completely independent of John? It already is. It is. Does it need YAML at all? That's a choice. Yeah. And warm. Fireplace. <laughs> you have a California shirt that fits. I that fits right. I have a hat on. You want to wear my hat? No, I'm fine. <laughs> Would it be possible to have sub areas for devices, aka indoor living rooms, so you can group devices in multiple areas? What? Uh, I mean, we, we well, actually, when we introduced areas, we were like, do we want to have like sub area so you can say this is the first floor and we have like areas inside oh, these areas yeah, so you have floors areas yeah and I mean we decided not to do it just because it's initially now we just need to build out areas to begin with like we haven't we're only scratching the surface of what we can do with areas and I think it was I mean, a nice discussion today actually right you want to elaborate no not elaborate <laughs> we, we, we today we had just uh, drop it in well, we had we had a lot of talk today, um, so so that's kind of cool. And areas is definitely one of the discussion points where we know that we can do more. Right. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Now I think sure one is. of the things is that we want to have the configuration panel kind of like be allowed to like dissect it by area. So like you pick your area and you can see which scenes and automations etc are related or influence that area in one way or another. Yeah, and you have love less few as well. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Is there any news in the partnership program for Nest? Fix the thermostat integration. I mean, I reached <laughs> out to them, but like, yeah, but I mean, I never got a response. Uh, I mean, I have some contacts at the Google Assistant crew, but like the Google Assistant uh, uh, teams. And I mean, I talked to them about like local SDK and stuff. So I'll bring it up. Um, I first want to get local SDK done, so, uh, but I think there's going to be a sandbox that they say they're going to offer. So that means that probably people can do some developer account sandbox easy way to like set up their own system and integrate their own nest. Um, I mean, they announced it for the end of next year, right? So <laughs> it's a long way ahead and then who knows what else comes up on the radar. So maybe that it wasn't, I don't know if it will actually be delivered. But I mean, once it comes up, comes out, we'll integrate it. Hey, we have Dr. Z's in the house. Hey, mate. Uh, as a noob to home automation, do you have any pitfalls to avoid when getting into Home Assistant? Yeah, yeah, I do, actually. Go for it. I, I will always say, do not connect everything at once and then try to make something out of it. Just add one thing and experiment with it. Like, Add one light and try to make some automations, and add a switch and try to control the light and do some automations. Like just 
drop something in one thing at a time. It's so easy to just like hook up every integration we have and, and fill up everything. And then you'll have like tons of entities that have no good naming and doesn't look well in the UI. And then you try to automate and you have to automate everything, which you cannot do. You can only automate one thing at a time. So right. if you just start slow, actually. Yeah. That would be my, my biggest tip ever. And where would you start? The light. Simple light on a place that doesn't matter that much in the beginning. The light is nice because you can do color, brightness, color temperature. It's the most thing else. Yeah. And with a motion sensor. For example, yeah, yeah or switch. It's a G switch. Device tracker. And add a Google, uh, Google or an Alexa to it and talk to it and see if you can, can connect it. Just keep things simple and slowly expand. Right. Yeah. Um, I saw some question about like, what is the next uh, Nabucasa feature that's going to be introduced? We don't actually yeah. have a, a next feature planned. Like, that's like, we're going to definitely build this. I mean, right now we're just all focused on just building a home assistant, um, just doing all the... Account extending account linking maybe? Right. Well, I mean, we're doing account linking. Like, we're going to add more, um, more partners to account linking. And that's going to be, I mean, but that's, but this is just working with like developers that are updating their integrations. Um, one thing that we're kind of exploring is I kind of want to see if we can do like encrypted backups of like the storage and configuration parts of your configuration. So you could maybe bootstrap a new installation or something, um, but it's something we have to explore and see how, if it can work out and if it's like feasible and how often it will be used compared to like a snapshot or something like this. It's idea. Yeah. What about user rights and permissions? Yeah, so that, in that one, we, we have a basic structure in place inside Home Assistant, but it really needs a lot of work and it's not a priority right now. I think the, just making Home Assistant easier to use, there's, you know, working on the automation stuff, um, improve the UI, that's, that's just a lot more important and like making sure that, because you know, just building out a permission system is one, but then making sure the whole system, you know, is audited to make sure there's no security holes and being able to call it a security system. That's like a big work, especially every integration will have to be audited to make sure that it's safe. And then we have a couple. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a lot of work. And so, yeah, that's, uh, I don't see that uh, happening anytime soon. Cells. Is there in the future a possibility to, to give the family their own login? Their old IDs. It's you possible can, uh, now. The only thing is, is that they use they share the same Lovelace UI. But yeah. yeah, you can already go to users and create more user accounts. But you can uh, from the next version or the previous version, you can uh, hide certain views for users. Yeah. So you could make a uh, user-specific Lovelace config. Sure. Yeah, it's still the same Lovelace config. It only shows sure. it hides certain views yeah, yeah. for some users. Sure. I love the new scenes editor. Thanks for all your great work. That's good. Yep. Yeah. Great. I like it. Well done. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Would you consider occupancy stage for areas? Well, I mean, there are some integrations that do that right now. Um, I don't know what the, I mean, there, I think there's like some room presence detection, uh, custom components. There are um, some, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really need much support in Home Assistant itself, right? If you could create yeah, an area is not a room per se, like it could be, I don't know, uh, my roof is an area. Right. I, yeah, if you have your roof as area in Home Assistant. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because my solar panels are on it. So I want to have the solar panels in that area. I don't know why, but I did. <laughs> yeah. I have no use for it, to be honest. But still, you can also I, put it no, in the garage. I, I tried to put it like every single device in an area. And then I got to the solar panels and I was like, okay, it's not in my living room. It's not my hallway. It's not my garage. Where is it? So I, I did roof. Cool. I don't know why. In line with the authentication question, would it be a possibility of something already built out like LDAP? 
can be done. Um, I think we already have a authentication provider that is uh, can outsource the authentication to a script, and then you can run a script whatever you want. And I think the example script was actually LDAP. Yeah, except that it doesn't work on Alpine, like uh, uh, on um, SIO, SOS. Oh, um, lacks the LDAP. Oh, okay. Well, so yeah, actually, you know. somebody could build like a proper auth provider, right? Well, I mean, right now we've been very limiting in auth providers just because it's, I don't know, like if you ever want to make some more changes, if it's necessary for like a permission, some kind of stuff, I'm kind of like hesitant about adding like more auth providers. That's where the script one was really like, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, that's kind of cool. That's true. Ian would like to know if someone is on uh, his roof. Catch Santa. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Any thoughts on adding additional statuses for person, like sleeping or driving? Um, people get creative, right? In uh, the device tracker from iOS, there is activity. Yeah. You can see if someone is walking or driving or cycling. Life360 has it as well, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's what the problem is, is that we need to have to, it has to be standardized. Once it's standardized, then like the person integration could like pick it up. Yep. So, but yeah, I mean, if we have things like the fitness tracker standardized, we could at least detect sleeping, for example. If, I mean, if that's broadcast live. Which yeah, I don't the think problem is with a person, person could have, a, this is device tracking a bit, right? Like, how would you determine what a person is doing based on a couple of entities to tie to a person? Like, his, my Fitbit would say X and my iPhone would say Y and... I would trust your Fitbit because it's on your... If it's on your wrist. Can you detect it? The Fitbit can. Because yeah. they try to get your heart rate, so... Yeah, true. true. Yeah, but... I know it's like live, accessible through the API. Probably not. Are we going to China? Any more news on the China trip? Uh, I know, I think there's a question directed to Dr. Z's. I know he's going to China to, I think PCB way, take a look at the factory. Kind of cool though. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I know, I have to So that's not us, by the way. <laughs> we'll let China come to us with uh, AliExpress. <laughs> <laughs> is it set to set a shorter period than one day in the default logbook? Oh, that's probably because of like the number of things loaded there. Um, I mean, not right now. I mean, the logbook and history panels have been really like neglected. Like we've been, yeah, there's just so many other ancient. priorities. I think we've really been focusing on like configuring Home Assistant compared to like reading the history or the logbook. Um, the big thing has been lost, ways, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, now the scene editor is in there. And so automation is getting some big revamp. So I love the, the, in the beta and the, in the, the release for, that's tomorrow, right? Oh, I have to fix the release. Yeah, you're the uh, charge. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have to write the release. Okay, so I have a job this morning, tomorrow morning. <laughs> no, the, the, I did not receive the front end. But no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now what, what was I going to say? Something uh, about the next release. Oh, the next release, what I love about the next release for Lovelace is that, or not Lovelace, for the automation editor, yeah. is that you add it to the possibility to define, I don't know, let's say the, the trigger is the device action and then uh, the action can be written up in JAML now. Yeah. So you can just click, okay, I want to have this action written up in JAML and you can write a JAML for just that little piece, just for the action. And I think that's a great feature that's coming in the, in the release yeah. for tomorrow. Even all the, it used to be that like, if we didn't know how to edit a trigger in the UI, it would just be shown as like a, some piece of JSON, and now it's actually a YAML editor. Yeah. That's yeah, really so nice. now you can really edit it, and do something useful with it, even yeah. if we don't support it in the UI. It doesn't work with Jinja. Uh, yeah. Cool. Should. That's something I uh, ran into. Yeah. Oh. 
And just keep on going, right? Let's see. It. Uh, with the best to rank the DeFi tracking person like a big GSM sensor. I mean, right now we, we need to even like work on the person like tracking algorithm, but the approach I think we should take is that the person integration is going to be, oh, thank you, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be very opinionated about how we're going <coughs> to weight the different like inputs, if it's like the source of a GPS tracker or from the router. And then if people want to have their own algorithms, they can set up like a device tracker with like different inputs that they configure themselves. Um, and then have the person just adopt whatever that one device tracker has, which represents multiple device trackers. So probably it's not going to be very configurable and it's going to be by design. Is there a fully Apple Watch coming? There is an Apple Watch. Yeah, fully yeah. Watch Apple. Watch app. I think they mean like a native app that just runs. Yeah, because right now it's complications only. It's just complication. Okay. I don't yeah. have an Apple Watch anymore. I, don't I mean, it all depends on app. like volunteers and the. I mean, it, it's it, it's difficult to make an app. Like, I mean, it takes time to build an app and like. Have you ever have, have you ever used? Uh, had, yeah, you had an Apple Watch. I had an Apple Watch. No, Apple I Watch. I used Fitbit. Okay, well, I I, I, I never Watch. used I an app. apps. Never ever. I you use the notifications, the, the actions on it, and the time because it's a watch. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, it was but, it was just a really expensive notification yeah. answer. Well, a little doorbell article I did for it. Uh, for, for, I actually use it. I I, I wrote the blog on the two dollar doorbell, and I have the doorbell, and it's kind of nice. Like we get notifications on uh, on our Apple Watch if somebody yeah. rings the doorbell, even if the kids are sleeping. That's I think nice. that's just that's yeah. that's the that powerful thing. Right. That's what I use it for. It. In an app? I've never used yeah. an app. I mean, that's actually why I went for Fitbit, because I don't want any notifications or apps on my uh, oh. wrist, but I can actually pay with this. It has Fitbit Pay, oh, and cool. it like buzzes when my, uh, for reminders and calls. Apple mm. Pay is now available on that one, so I'm starting oh. using it like ah. recently. Thank uh, you. And yeah, I think it's kind of cool. Well, so at Fitbit Pay, we work with uh, Rabobank too here. Yeah. yeah. So everywhere you can swipe your normal uh, card. debit card, you can sw swipe the Fitbit. The fire place looks cozy. It's mainly warm. Is it? it well, I mean, I took a nap earlier. It was really good. <laughs> 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 Would it be possible to link to HA instances? Yeah, I have a custom component for that. Actually, we play. You played with it. Play I play. I have a even. I, it What's uses it? like a config flow. It uses just a UI to like, and use the OAuth helpers that we built. Um, it but it's only to link. It will only tell you if the instance is up or down. It doesn't like actually. We, we used to have uh, something like that, but uh, yeah, a long, long time yeah, ago. No, but so the thing and is, we had the MQTT. Uh, yeah. No. So the the one we had originally was very hacky. It was kind of like with webhooks, and you would fire it off, and if like the instance went down, things didn't work. The one that came closest, we once got a pull request for like multiple instance linking, but it was the wrong way around. So it was like the, the, the master, the one that like has the, the source of truth would like connect to all its like uh, satellite instances. Yeah. And, but the one had to know about all the satellite instances and if they went down, it didn't work. And um, they put a lot of the CPU time actually on like the head. And so, that one is actually available as a custom component. I think you can like Google something like Home Assistant, Remote. I but think the biggest problem will be if you have two instances, it's like who's the captain? Like who, right, yes, who one, has be master. One, one has to be a master or a slave, but, but that means like one is just a device passing thingy. Well, my, the way I would yeah. see it, because that's actually the original one had this where you would even forward service calls and like all integrations would just deal with ent entities that they knew about. That was just a mess because nobody knew what was going on anymore. But uh, there's a difference between do you want uh, it for redundancy, like if one goes down, the other takes over, or do you want it because you have to physically plug in devices into an instance that not, is not close to your main home system? Right. I think if, you, uh, if you're looking for like high availability and failovers to other instances, then you should look into like. I don't know, the virtual machine world and actually start doing those kinds of things. I don't think you should solve that with home systems. No, it'll no. be 
very difficult. Yeah, it'll swarm or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, having one instance like forward states is pretty easy to like another instance. It's just that like how are you going to register lights and stuff? It's going to be that's entity tricky. names. Yeah. The collisions. One turns it on, the other turns it off. I don't know. Yeah. Very complicated. When could you do a Fictron integration? I don't know. I have no idea what it is. Great Dutch products forward to have on solar battery installations. I'm not familiar with it. I tend to actually not build something I... Like if I build an integration... Like, I'm not sure, things change now a bit, but before I would build an integration just because I have the device. I did not build something. I had a lot of requests for building things, but I kind of tend to not to if I do not have access to it. There's no way to make sure things work properly, sure. to maintain things. So in this case, yeah, probably not. What updates are coming next for the Android app? Um, a lot. I mean, there's, uh, there's some open pull requests right now. We actually it's been fascinating. We didn't have an Android app for so long, and now there's just all these people like, oh, I know Android, and they're like all chiming in. So the biggest thing we're working on right now, so device tracking was just launched like two, three days ago, where it, like, we'll yeah. report your location. Um, the next thing that's coming is to be able to turn it on and off in the settings, which is useful. Um, and the other thing that's coming is to make, right now, I think every 15 minutes, it will just get your GPS, send it off. Um, and we're gonna make it so, it's just based on the zone, so you have to find a home assistant. So you can either say, which is very battery efficient, so it's going to be like opt-in. You can say if it, were, if it has to be on zones, because then Android core system will be more, uh, uh, I don't know, it's more battery efficient, and it will only when it enters or leaves the zone, it will open the app, and the app will send a message. Um, that's going to be very battery efficient. Yeah. And other things that like encryption is one, so that uh, data that is sent over webhooks is being encrypted. With some mobile app supports, I think more sensors sending back. Somebody was looking into notifications. Uh, yeah. Notifications, push notifications is a big one. I mean, Robbie did some like initial exploration, and he's, I think he's hoping someone else will pick it up because he's mainly doing iOS, of course. Um, and then the other thing was, oh, somebody wants to have like a sensor that represents your the time of your next alarm to be uh, sent to uh, a home assistant. So you can use your phone's phone. alarm to uh, do stuff. It would be cool if you could set it actually like an automation to set your alarm for the next day on your phone. But also handy to do some things in your home when your alarm goes off. If you're like on an irregular open schedule. Open the, the curtains and uh, turn on the lights. And oh, sure. Yeah. Based on the alarm set. On the alarm time yeah. of your Android phone. That's cool. So okay. just set the time on your Android phone and your house, my iPhone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think your iPhone allows you. No, they won't. Is the cheese player a company write off? No, <laughs> actually not. <laughs> so I'm taking another one. Yep. Thanks, Frank. No problem. The only thing I want for the remote HA instance is get the Bluetooth back. Yeah, but yeah. The other one wants something else. That's kind of when mm -hmm. will there be sensors for Proxmark? I think it's in the release for tomorrow. Proxmark mm -hmm. VE? I thought it was in the release for tomorrow. I haven't tried it though. There's, yeah, there is a, there's a Proxmark uh, binary sensor. I have Proxmark running now. Yes, yes it's Proxmark in tomorrow's release. release. Yeah. We're all I, really up to date. <laughs> <What's the> ideal <laughs> hardware setup to run 20 to 30 devices and lights. I just a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I Raspberry Pi 4. Sure. I mean, yeah, works fine. I'm still kind of hesitant to, to recommend a Pi. Why? Raspberry Pi 4, that is. 3 I would do, but I still have issues with it. It could be just me. Yeah. Did you install this know, firmware? Because they did some firmware update for the heating. No, it's just like all the things they had with it, like heating and the tuning down in the firmware, the USB C port not being okay. I don't know. That's just personal, I think. It's not. I don't have one, so I can actually. But for 
20 to 30 device, a Raspberry Pi 3. Will do the trick as well. Yeah. Just yeah. buy a Raspberry Pi. Absolutely. Will there ever be any way to customize the graph and sensor pop-up window? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think if we ever put some serious effort in the history tab, I mean, you know, we have better control of the graphs. I personally really hate the look of them. No. So right. I would love to do some work. I, I really like mini graph card, the yeah. looks of that one. Right. I totally agree. But the so, mini graph uh, card is not always very useful. Well, I guess the no, mini graph can, card with the dots. change the, the, right. the, the... Yeah, I mean, we should, I mean, we could just adopt it. Yeah. Or somebody could contribute it. But uh, yeah, I think there's some room for it. Yeah. That. No, but also like if you, once you open a more info for a sensor, it would be great to say, okay, just show me like five days, show me 10 days. Like yeah. it shouldn't just be like 24 hours. It's, um, but I mean, that part has, Really not changed since like, I don't know, four or five years? Or so we changed it from uh, Google uh, Cloud uh, right. to, to local. To local, true. That's, uh, that's changed. the oldest part of the UI? The oldest part of the UI? UI. States, uh, States DevTools. The States DevTools is really old. I mean the events DevTools. Well, at least that one got subscribe added. Like, uh, yeah, that was uh, also in a quite different UI. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So, I mean, the dev tools are really the oldest parts, um, I think, still around. Because even the sidebar has been revamped, uh, yeah. Lovelace has been there, yeah. Yeah, config is quite new. Yeah, I mean, in the history of Logbook, actually, those are yeah, really old, old too. And the, and well, the maps? And the map, too. Well, we did, yeah, map, too. It used to be Google Maps, right? It's no, changed. no, no. No? I saw a Google Maps once, in a mock-up, maybe. Uh, actually, I, I yep. used to not use that. No, we used to use, uh, no, yeah, it was Google Maps, you're right. Yeah, one really thing. back in the day, that we changed to certain like tiles from like an OpenStreetMap provider, but they shut us down and then we went to another one, CartoDB, which we use today. It's done? <laughs> hmm? It's done? Yeah. Your head, <laughs> your head is too awesome. My head is too awesome. We gotta balance it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take it off. Okay, let's see. I really love home system integrations nowadays with things like ESP Home. Yeah, ESP Home is amazing. Better. Yeah. And WLED even. Uh, making custom hardware so much easier and approachable for a lot of people. True. That's true, especially ESP Home. It's utterly the... Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. I just, I don't, I don't know, I got like... I feel there could be some more tutorials about like really the basics of like ESP Home. Auto recently added a, a tutorial page or like a, like a, a written about ESP Home page or something to his website. Okay. So you can now find all the tutorials online, oh, and all the blogs, and he have linked them all. It's like an oh, insane big list. That's nice. kind of nice. Yeah. Also YouTube videos and stuff. That's so good. I think it's kind of smart. Like he's outsourcing it. But I mean, he like, should. I mean, it's. These projects are big to maintain, right? Like, whenever you get to a certain size, like, we cannot do this alone either in Home Assistant. Right. So, yeah, Auto needs help. If you know ESP Home, help Auto. Yeah. Some of ESP Home's documentation could be better. I mean, hey, it's open out. source. Yeah. <laughs> help them out. And while you're at it, please help us as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Is there a way to use satellite map style? No, there's not. It's there, there are a bunch of tile providers, right? Yeah, but satellite is like, those are satellite photos and those yeah. are usually paid for. Yeah. I don't think there's like free satellite photos. I mean, Google pays for them and gives them to us for free when you open Google Maps, yeah. but actually, I mean, using Google Maps is very expensive. Yeah, it, it, it is very expensive as well, by the way. Right. Uh, you used, you used to be able to do it without an API key, but now you need an API key and they yeah. charge you well. Yeah, yeah. You, they charge you. And then the problem is, even if we like, you know, I've been thinking about like, can we provide an API key, for example, like through Home Assistant Cloud? But the problem is you have to whitelist domain names and we cannot. So we would have to whitelist any local network computer ever. And so that's going to be abused the hell out of it. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I can't put like, doesn't work, sadly. Or you would have to proxy it. You can also 
What now with proxy image? images and then like you have to check <laughs> authentication headers and like would be really complicated. Yeah. It's not worth it. Congratulations on the promotion, Frank. Just watched the State of the Union yesterday. What a trip you guys made. Well, first of all, thank you. <laughs> and secondly, yeah, we made a hell of a trip. Yeah, yeah, that's uh it's only getting better. So more than America. <laughs> yeah. I've been on the project now for two and a half years. Things that has been done and changed and extended and in this those two and a half years it's just like no it's two years. Okay, I already forgot what we two thousand seventeen, two thousand two years now. Yeah. The number of things is just insane. Like I mean config entries is two years old. And only after that did we get like registries or like all that stuff, right? It's, it used to be pretty wild, wild west. Yeah. I remember fiddling around with the stage panel to get things like looking a bit decent. <laughs> I'm fiddling with Lovelace because we have so many options that I cannot decide, which is kind of like nice. And, right. But yeah. Wow. How many employees does Nabucasa have? We have four full-time people working on it. Yeah. Frank, Bram, me, and Pascal. And then we have Cognito, who is uh, who's part-time helping out with support in like the cloud channel and like support tickets and helping out with like uh, styling the breaking changes and release notes and pretty much helping out wherever. I know. I've been on board since twenty four point one. That's a long time. That's a long time. Yeah, the yeah. first version that was like actually versioned was 0 0.7. 17. I think it was 0 0.7. Before that was just like date stamps whenever I cut a release. <laughs> I felt like it. And then we were like, people, oh, we should do some versioning. And so I, I did 0.7 because then, you know, we didn't look like we were 0 0.1 or something. We like got evolved somewhat. And then, you know, now we're at 103. <laughs> <laughs> Which is wild. I remember installing HA via IO script. Yeah. And I actually talked about that. Kind of cool. Yep. Back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, the problem with all the, a lot of the installation scripts is that the installation scripts, right? Like, installing it's the easy part. It's like yep. ev evolution over time, like new Python versions, dependencies that have different, like, Compilation stuff like the the maintenance is the, the, the painful part. Yeah. yeah, that's the nice part of Docker and uh, the SIO. SIO. It's one click. Both, both like Docker and SIO. Well, they're using now the same base actually. Yeah, yeah that's kind of nice. That's maintenance less for us. Right. Uh, and the experience is more streamlined. But yeah, like the Docker world just changed the way Home Assistant worked. Like about two years back as well. Right. We've talked about 1.0 a lot. What are the dreams for 2.0? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, now we're going to fence size. Yeah. No, I mean, that's difficult to say. I don't know, like, even if we do 1.0, is it going to be like, how is the version going to work even after that? I don't know. Um, and I don't even know what are like, you know, think about like what are the long term targets? Like right now, it's pretty straightforward. I feel like we want to just make it like kind of easier, and then we're kind of expanding into like voice and assistance right now, um, or integrating those parts, and definitely want to make that better. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just like how can we make different parts of your home work better? And you know, ESP Home I see is like a big part. I want to like you know that really works well for like custom hardware, and I think. I don't know. I think 2.0 uh, is more about uh, artificial intelligence, maybe also, and, and seeing patterns in your daily usage and, and adapting to that and suggesting right. things to users based on uh, you always turn the light on at 8 o'clock. You want us to do that for you? or Okay, so that, that piece of code is done. It's actually, That's um, if, you, if you install the Jupyter Notebook uh, Haseo add on, it will actually load our uh, Has Detective like. Jupyter yeah. Notebook, which I think is also on GitHub. Um, and it actually includes this code of like, 
based on certain specific times yeah. of the day, it will look at which entities you interact with and it will like suggest those. My, my idea was, but, was but that, that, that's just visualization or of, of data. Now right. you should act on that automatically. I'm, I, I have a little more boring answer. It's just a version number. That's for one and two. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, no, it, it is, is, but it is, it is. It is. <laughs> and actually, I, I, I'm more like I'm, I'm more like the Semfer fanboy. So the major release would indicate breaking changes. So sure. actually, yeah, it's not about features. It's it's about breaking changes, in my opinion, at that point. But that's yeah. something we have to discuss sometime. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe I hope by that time we have integrations independently be able to update from the core. Which yeah. should definitely help. Yeah. Um, which I mean, there's no promises that we're going to do that next year, but it's been always on the roadmap ever since we introduced Manifest. Yeah. Like a year ago. <laughs> That's not even... something like that. Well, uh, somewhere like this year, I think. Oh, this one's nice. Just out of curiosity, how are you guys communicating with each other? Are you using something like Microsoft Teams, Skype, for example? Uh, Discord. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I think. Mm. 80% now, 95% on Discord, and we have uh, Hangouts Chat, which is like the other 5%. And we were actually discussing today, like, why are we even on it still? Yeah. But, yeah. But, yeah, it's just Discord, which, because, you know, we're all on Discord anyway, and a lot of the discussions just, you know, happen in the open, right? We're not, it's not like, the Nabucasa employees are in their private chat, like discussing, strategizing. Like this is this is a community effort. So we open architecture issues. We talk in like the backend channel. Most of stuff is just on the GitHub pages, like where you guys are at, where at yeah. too. And, and sure, we do have a private channel, but that's more like for discussing customer issues with cloud or something. Yeah, but that's more. I don't know. It never happens, by the way, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, 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 yeah, most of stuff is just open. Or uh, we do have a meeting every week. Yeah. Via at this moment via Google Google Hangout or your Google Meet. Meet. We it's Google called Hangout. this month. I mean, <laughs> just still a different name. All right. Will Ada be able to run off a pie in the future? It can. You yeah, can actually go to Ada today. I think it means a remote pie. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Pala cool. is just a command line app. So, you pass in the home system URL, which can be on another computer. You pass in a long lived access token. You pass in which platform to use for speech to text. Pass in the platform to use for text to speech. And then you have to make sure that I think Alsa Sound is installed on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. And then it will just work. Cool. Just. I mean, the problem yeah. is, however, we should document it. Yes, it's not documented. I think that's the... That's the problem. We should just make it a Docker container. It is already. No, well, no, there's no, there's a HSAO container, but there's not like a standalone Docker container, but... We could extract one. Yeah. Well, the chat, I mean, running Docker with like Elsa and stuff is a little pain. It is. That's true. Yeah. But I want to be able to update it more quickly. True. But we, yeah. Right. Is Ubiquity still involved? No, they're not. They uh, they stopped their home automation uh, efforts involvement uh, in April this year. I think it was. Yeah, still 2019. So yeah, they're no longer involved. Wow. Yeah. This is the first beta I have haven't seen go through any iterations. Uh, Actually, it did today, today. <laughs> yeah. today we uh, we attacked beta one. So, yeah. um, no, I mean the big. Well, one of the reasons for it is that I flew to the Netherlands uh, this weekend, so that uh, kind of messed up my schedule. Um, and it was pretty bug free. Yeah, which no, no big problem. problem. We haven't made any mistakes. <laughs> hmm? Oh, Are you on a phone, phone ring? Oh yeah. no, my phone is. Uh, yeah, I have this thing set up, but it will. But if it's 80% charged, it will buzz. Oh, okay. To protect my battery. Yeah. My only issue with Ada is that you need a bunch of pies to have it in every room. Each running home assistant. Now you don't have to have home assistant on them, but you 
do need a bike or something in every room if you want. That's for sure. sure. <coughs> Is there a plan in the future to create a store for integrations instead of delivering them all in every release? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we would really love to decouple the integrations from the releases in the future. Absolutely, and we the foundation is kind of there already. So yeah, absolutely. Are there any building options to make homes? Is it highly available? No, we just discussed that. You should just use a, a form or some virtual. Uh, Functions for that instead of uh, having home assistant arranged. I like the one from the meetup, by the way. There, this is kind of cool. Since we dis actually, I, I raised this this thing today. I have way too many automations today. Do you plan on a way to better better organize them in tabs or tags, or have them to filter and search to do the job as well? Yeah. So yeah, we do actually. Yeah, the search uh, for sure. Yeah. And uh, filtering, tagging, something, we, we will work on that. Yeah. Yeah. We recognize there's a problem. Yeah. yeah. That's the best word for it. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Is there a plan to visualize large complex, complex automations? Well, the problem with visualizing automations, I mean, I've been thinking about like, I mean, we can draw kind of like diagrams of like, you have the different triggers and then there's all like lines to the conditions and... Like node red kind of lines. Yeah, I mean, we can do a similar thing, but I'm not sure if it's gonna help that much. I know, I mean, I, I'm, I've, I've been thinking, I wanna kind of have a visualization way of like, can we take any automation and just visualize it into a bunch of icons, like three or four, just so when you're scanning the list, you can kind of maybe recognize things, but... I know, just been thoughts, never. Could, be, could that be helpful if you could assign like an icon to that? Mmm, that'd be nice. Like just, I don't know, like a staircase could make help that this is an automation that yeah. puts my hair somewhere. I like that. Or even upload a picture, which we talked about it today as well. Yeah, we could Or a custom icon. It could be a picture. How do you think about the Modics? Well, Modics is... I think what the Modics has done one thing really well is like it's fully Y. Which is also one of their biggest bottlenecks, I guess. I never used it personally. No, neither did I. I've tried it. It's kind of cool. The biggest problem with the Modics, it's written in C. Oh, it is? So it's very hard for people to contribute. It's very hard to find contributors in general. So it grows less fast. And I think the project is like slowing down. I feel like it's slowing down. I don't know. Yeah. Animation simulator. To check if things go the way you want them to go. Yeah, there's a run knob button run. Yeah, but it bypasses. That's one of the things I see a lot. <laughs> like they try it with a trigger. Like, hey, well, yeah, no, there was a there was a PR by Centerboard actually about like, I don't know what actually happened to it. Maybe it's still open. But it was about like, should trigger include or not include conditions? Yeah, and I, I felt like I mean, what I why why should trigger include conditions? That's what I thought. Well, if you want to test your automation right now, the only thing to do is like. Do it for real, or hit the trigger button, which bypasses the conditions. So there's no okay, way by to test your condition. Does but it, we it... should be able to just have the. I mean, we should make an API endpoint where you throw conditions that have to be say true or false. Yeah, probably. I mean, we can because we can put that in the actual automation editor. Just like, hey, this is true right now. This is false right now. Or yeah, and we could test your automation real time. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, your conditions, yeah. Creating, yeah. Right now, it's just trigger only the trigger part. Right. Well, but if you if you would just 
visualize in the editor if the trigger would be valid right now or the condition or just check boxes the check marks and true sure. yeah Lydia's is right I mean you can just mess with the state panel <laughs> that's that's how I do a lot of stuff too yeah but I mean you need some yes. this is the thing this is, yeah. you need some deep understanding right like we're trying to get <laughs> that requirement of deep understanding like not necessary anymore so yeah let's get uh, some check boxes check marks Bram will have it done by the end of uh, next week yeah sure <laughs> I know it's Tuesday no oh it's it this end, week. end of this week yeah sure <laughs> Is space in your life a protege? I have two kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Two busy ones. Wait, sure. so Sander asked, trigger with conditions would be amazing. Why? Yeah, I wonder. Why? What's the use case, Sander? You have a condition. So you want to test the condition and you can test the trigger. Well, I, I mean, they something. could have like manual automations where like they decide at some other trigger. That's weird. You could make a button like, I don't know, a button on your system where you, which you would click and that has a condition to make it actually click. So you could call an automation based on a button in your Lovelace, test if the condition, if the button was pushed like, I don't know, in the last five minutes, then ignore it. Right. I guess that's... That's like far-fetched maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Still the why. Shortcuts does a nice job visualizing an automation. Oh. So it's shortcuts from Apple. Apple. Yeah, I don't use an iPhone, but do you use shortcuts? You're yeah, the only, like you're the only Apple user here. The the Home Assistant I was have support for it. I heard. That's true. Right. We discussed it today. I, I I look at my Twitter feed. I can make a call, send my wife a text, and I see notifications, and that's about it. Uh, shortcuts. Shortcuts. Yeah, there is. I have an OK Google shortcut, probably. <laughs> yeah, don't Sorry be. about that one. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Everybody stop. <laughs> <sighs> Google is not the problem. It needs an extra word. But if you start saying, <laughs> then, like, she tried it out once, by the way. Daphne. She Did? came in and she just shouted, like, I don't know, hey, then the other. Uh, Thing, play some music and like everybody on the stream <laughs> I'm amused right now when I start my media player I turn off my lightning automations when I then stop the media player I turn them back on but I also want to set the correct scene why do you need conditions I don't get it it turns on the automations and then triggers them to kind of activate it's kind of like a schedule if you have like a, I mean he just wants to if, if the automations would trigger right now if after he's playing a movie he wants them to have set the right scene I will get a duplicate automation button uh, yeah. yeah there's a duplicate button in the automation editor now yeah it's, it's disabled yeah, there was like what, a plan. There was like a, <laughs> uh, was like a, a plan. Like, <laughs> but it's been disabled for since introduction. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I understand Sandler. That, that's uh, a valid use case. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess we should uh, add that somehow. Well, I think there's also, I mean, Bachia is working on like a scheduler integration where yeah. we can have scenes be like scheduled be activated and like when you turn on it will actually check if the scene should be active and activated but it's it's still a work in progress i mean there's an architecture issue discussing it it uh, will take some time to like flesh it all out but yeah i can see the use case now i'll have a look at the vr that center board is open i think ah uh, yucks yeah they're playing now <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm missing it. Oh. Uh, can we easy way to check slash alert if integration slash devices are still active or alive? There's no like online state on a device or something. There's connection binary sensor. 
I mean, uh, we should like the, the Unify integration it. has this. I can see if the devices are connected to the internet. Yeah, but that's because like no, there's a, no, not the device. It's on the entity level. Um, it exposes an entity like a binary sensor, or probably the state's unavailable. Right, it would be something, but there's no way to say is this device online? Yes or no? From a perspective, of I would. Device, I mean, I would say that if it's not online, it's unavailable. No, that would be like the entities, not right. the device itself. But like we now search for a battery uh, sensor in a device, we could also send, search for a device class okay. connectivity for a device to get the state of the device. That would be something to think about. Hundred fifty devices you have a naming issue. Yeah, well I mean yes, it's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't expose hundred and fifty. <laughs> Can you even expose the many devices? I don't think Google supports it. I think Google when I, I was at, when I was meeting the Google team, they said that like they don't uh, there's a certain upper limit. It's uh, I don't remember the amount. Why not adding more custom components to real integration? Some awesome custom components are really a long time still custom and not official. Integrate it. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Create a PR. <laughs> Open up a PR, add them. No, uh, yeah. I mean this is a I mean this is the kind of problem we have in Home Assistant where we allow custom everything. Every layer is customizable, overridable. And it means that it makes it easy for us to say no and like keep the quality we want while low, still allowing people freedom to build whatever they want and use it. Um, but it also means that, you know, as the Home Assistant custom store gets more popular and more people just start building custom integrations, which is great, but if it doesn't get into core, the distribution will, like the Home Assistant itself will get hurt, right? So it's up to the developers that if their integration is successful and it's proven that people want this or like the bugs are squashed to Submit it to Home Assistant. That's not something, I mean, we're not gonna go around and be like, I'm copying that, I'm copying that. The developer will have to, you know, take ownership because once bugs happen, they also should be the ones fixing it, not us. I think the major point and the biggest pain at the same time for uh, people to contribute their custom components is like the whole review process. Like as soon as, as as we all start looking at it from from a core perspective as a home assistant to like the contribution and the integration being added, oh well, we're going absolutely we're going to look at the code and making sure that it works perfectly and that everything meets standards and looks perfect and works perfect. But with a custom integration or a custom component, that's not the case. Like everybody can publish anything and it could do like anything with your system. It could just break things and that happens from time to time. So it's it's like if if somebody adds it to home assistant, it's it takes energy and time from both sides, from us and from the one contributing. So that's kinda like like creating a custom component is like easy. You just open up a repo on GitHub, push up the code and here it is. Good luck. Yeah. Um, the other side of the story is that well, you're missing the opportunity to, to learn and to improve your your component and to share it like with a bigger audience. So I don't know. It's just I yeah. personally would definitely recommend if you're having if you have a custom component, open up in PR. Even if it doesn't get merged, you will still get feedback and improve things. Right. Yep. And we find. I mean, this. The biggest thing that often when we do reviews that we see from custom components is that they've been blocking the event loop, which means that when they are fetching data, they block all of Home Assistant from doing anything. And you don't really notice it if the data fetching is fast, but if it ever takes like five seconds, nothing in Home Assistant works. So it's one of the most common issues, actually. Right. Probably. What's the best way to track a smartphone presence? In I think presence detection is a pain in general. Yeah. Well, it's because like devices go to sleep and they might disconnect from Wi Fi and these kind of things. And you yeah. scan for the IP or GPS location or. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I, I mean, I like the Home Assistant apps. Just sending. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I used to use own tracks. Now I use the Android app. Um, but he specifically said without installing additional applications on the phone. Besides Home Assistant, I assume, right? Like because you wanna. Yeah, if you have an iPhone, you could use. There's an integration for iCloud somewhere. Yeah, but the custom one. The problem with yeah, the iCloud it drains your battery. Yeah, it drains your battery uh, because it will request your location from uh, by yeah. Apple. Yeah, because it uses the Find My iPhone yeah. uh, API. I do not have any automations or things based on my. Yeah. No, the, the, the iCloud integration is bad because if you have the iPhone app or the Android app for Home Assistant, it will ask the system, "Tell me when the location is updated, yeah. and I will let Home Assistant know." Yep. Okay. And with the iCloud integration, Home Assistant say, hey iCloud, wake up the iPhone, even if it's in deep sleep, to tell the location right now. And that means that the phone gets out of deep sleep a lot more during the day. That's not good. Yeah, your battery will drain. Yeah. I was calling the apps with greatest device tracking. Yep. Google Maps location sharing on Android isn't bad because it's already sharing that anyway. If you it's true. Well, no, it's true, but it's based on like web scraping. It's not an official API by Google. That's the, the issue. But that's if you share your location with Google, right? Right. It's opt-in. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean a and lot of people. Google, Google Assistant will trick you kind of it. You get like your Google Maps timeline. Like I think a lot of people do. But, yeah. Combining to person is not perfect yet. Nope. It's not so hard. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna, well, this thing, we have an architecture issue, and in the architecture issue, it talks about this, which I think Arsibu also, uh, Alok, I mean, was involved as well. Um, and I mean, we're, the thing is, it's been just lingering around. We just need to implement it. Right now, the person, I mean, we added the person integration, and then it just kind of like moved on even before it was to a state where it was really usable. We did the same with the system lock integration where like we removed all the uh, uh, integrations that are loaded from your uh, dev tools and said, we'll add it later back. And then we didn't. So yeah, these are like two of the things, person and system lock that requires more attention. I like the one by uh, here's running, by the way, Paulus, maybe you want to do that one. We have plans to implement more visual automations at an like the Modix block play, to create more advanced automations of being load red. So, I mean... <laughs> I pass this one to you yeah. for a reason. I, I hate <laughs> Blockly. Like, like Blockly, Blockly is really old already. No, but I think, I mean, <laughs> I think that Blockly is not easy enough. With Blockly, you're really getting to a... It's like, it's visual, but it's still programming and it yeah. doesn't like make it easy enough. I think, um, I think both the users and the programmers do not understand it because it's not made for users and it's not made for programmers. It's, it's creating yeah. a learning to program, maybe, just yeah. to dip your toes in programming, but in an official way. Yeah. No, I think that, that's, that's true. And I think where, but we, We've been targeting like to make it easier, right? I think, I mean, that's where device automations really help. The, the new automation scaffolding using like Almond really helps. Like you just say the sentence, we figure it out. We, you know, you fill in the slots. Yeah. I mean, we were discussing today. We want to see if we can do kind of like a, I know, like a paste bin for like home assistant automations where you can easily like share automations that people can fill in placeholders or something like this. Um, I mean, cause there's like, Sharing YAML is one, but when you look at the YAML file, it's not always clear what's happening exactly. So if this could be visualized, I don't know, there's some opportunities there. Um, yeah. You still need to be a bit of a nerd to get home assistant up and running. I think you have to be a bit of a nerd to I mean, the moderation world, to be honest. Well, I mean, yeah, because we still need Etcher, and you still need to like flash an SD card, and you need to like, you need to be a little bit of a nerd. You used to be yeah. a big nerd. Yeah, but I think I mean there's some opportunities there as well to make it easier. I think we talked about like 
to a fork etcher to allow you to set up Wi-Fi credentials from like the UI, um, these kind of things. And yeah, I mean, I think that there's some opportunity. I mean, I wish we could just use some, some netboot or something that we can like, just have like a small operating system that bootstraps yourself from the internet and downloads everything. But that could be done. I mean, it could be done, but it's, yeah, we need to figure it out. But yeah, so you still need to be some uh, some bit of a nerd. Yeah. Please don't kill us old school guys preferring to do things by a text, by taking everything. To oh, that's such a misconception. I see this lately a lot, a lot. like people complaining that we're taking everything to the UI, which is... Well, in yeah, we're only taking things to the UI that can already be done in YAML, right? It's not like there's no UI only features. I mean, everything is easier in the UI because we can show you autocomplete. We can like, I think, uh, I think we would like to think of like authentication, like the integration setup. That's some, uh, some, some integrations do UI only for integrations. Maybe. maybe that's the point. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, those, that's true. But a lot of these integrations are, they, if they do OAuth too, it means that you have to be redirected to a website to get mm -hmm. like tokens and these tokens have to be updated. Like this is not something you can store in YAML. And it's not something I would like to share, to be honest. No. I would not share my credentials, but all the other things are still just there. Right. I mean, they, they did, I talked about this in the, the State of the Union, of course. It's that, um, anything authentication wise, you don't want to share anyway. So, you know, that will be in the... We'll see if we can make it as easy as possible in the UI only. Things like scenes, automation, scripts, you know, those will be always YAML and GUI. Like, and that, that's going to be there. Um, we did do some talking today about like how we're kind of like mixing it now a bit and it becomes a bit complicated. We got some ideas to kind of like make it more clear cut of like what is like written in YAML, what's written in like the UI editable. Yeah. We'll see some changes there soon, but I mean the YAML is never going away. I think that's that's pretty clear. I think that the the sharing is very important to us. Um, storing it in like version control is very important for the people who care about it, and I think there's no reason to take it away. So I mean we're not doing it. Yeah. Yeah. How long until you three would feel comfortable deploying AA into your parents' homes? I mean, my parents run a home assistant, they, and like now with like home assistant cloud, you can easily like remote like manage your systems. Um, I mean, it's I would be comfortable running it, but they're not. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the main issue. It's not like I'm not I'm not uncomfortable deploying home assistant. I'm uncomfortable deploying automations in general, like. I yeah, don't know. I think that's well. My my parents they don't use automations. They like to talk to Google to turn on the lights. Oh, that's to play music. Yeah. Um, I installed this one IKEA light in the living room, and it was like kind of buggy, and it kept like the brightness wasn't stable, and that was very annoying. So I think that one they turned off. But generally, they like uh, what's going on. All this list with his parents clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do now. Whenever I go to Europe, right, I'm like either with my parents or I'm with my in laws. That says I went out to drop off the kid at school, came back, I know where Xmas had. It's, <laughs> it's false, not mine. <laughs> I had the worst, worst luck with Trashfree. Why, mate? I'm actually enjoying those. I think, I mean, with Trashfree, I think the. The biggest thing with Home Assistant is that don't use a Threadfire integration, but use like a Zigbee stick. I think that the gateway uses like co-op uh, protocol and a co-op protocol library that we use in Python is not super stable, loses connection, these kind of things. And so, I mean, I, I suggest the decon stick because with decon stick, you have the option. You can either use the built-in Zigbee stuff in Home Assistant, which is really solid. But you can also decide, hey, I'm just going to use the decons the, the decons app an add-on, which is, comes like with their own app to manage this stuff, which is also really solid. Like both of these integrations 
are like platinum level, have like very active developers and they're really solid. Yeah, you can actually find out what you like. Like you use ZHA. Yeah, I you use it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, uh, it's just really personal, I think. I use, I, I, the, the, the thing I hated most about the IKEA for fear actually, when I, um, when I created uh, AdGuard in the add-on and deployed AdGuard in my network, actually my truck fear started dying every time and I couldn't figure out why. Uh, and then I noticed when AdGuard was off, I didn't have that issue. So I started digging in the logs and the thing is sending out like log requests of things that happens to IKEA. Uh, mm. Like to a central logging place yeah. for, for errors and those kinds of things. Um, like developers use many times in, in those like systems. But if you block it, it would just pile up. It probably <laughs> crashes itself. So that's kind of weird. I was thinking, okay, why is it sending stuff? So now it's just local. I, yeah. I really love the decon stick. Really, the stick works well. Yeah, King says decons works great. Well, yeah, <laughs> of course, game. Yeah, you want to maintain it. <laughs> yes, you can. If you, if you, if you want to meet game, um, he's going to yeah. be at the home assistant meetup next week um, on Tuesday, the seventeenth. Is it Tuesday? I think it's a Tuesday uh, in Copenhagen. So if you're in Denmark, come stop by. I'll be there too. I'll bring home assistant stickers and Visual Studio Code stickers, which I got from Case at the State of the Union. Right, so Tuesday. Say hi to the lady in the background. Say hi. <laughs> Just waving. Good morning, Oh. Have you guys ever thought about a fail saying high availability? Yeah, we had that part a couple of times now already. That's more like problem to solve on a different level. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 these are kind of the problems that, like, it's not always the, the thing that we, you know, that it shouldn't, like, it's not really worth our energy. Like, only very few people really want to have, like, a complete 100% reliable system that, like, will never fail. I think if you just run it on an Intel NARC or whatever, like, you'll definitely have a very reliable system. Yeah, it surprised me in the beginning. I mean, I run it on my, I run Unraid. And I have like a Docker container with Home Assistant. It's just always good. Yeah, never forms. Why isn't my girlfriend getting me one bottle after dinner? Good question. <laughs> yeah. Need better automations. Ever going to have a meetup in the New York City area? I mean, organize one. I know that like in the New York City area, Juan M. Tech is there. You can find me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. I like New York. I know there's I a bunch of uh, users in New York, so. I mean, I just love New York. You've been there a couple of months before you began. Yeah, there. yeah. When I was working at Ubiquity, I was living there for three months. In Manhattan? Manhattan is great. Manhattan it's just, is great. But like, I mean, we were living Lower East Side and. Have, we had our, our son was like five months old and yeah. it's, it's not very stroller friendly it's very small everything like just like you have to fold up the stroller go into a restaurant and like where they will put it like downstairs there's not really a place to put it anywhere and that was tough i think i've waited a bit too long oh the cozy yeah. fire <laughs> oh man You guys rock, keep it up, and enjoy the holidays. Holidays are coming. Thank That's you. Sure. Thank you. I run SAS VM and VMware for your stable, never had a crash. That's good to hear. It doesn't matter actually where it runs. No, I mean, it's, it's the, the core is stable. The core is stable. It's just sometimes some integrations go haywire. Sometimes it is stop working, VM is crashing. Uh, is it possible to have a kind of notification if HA is not online? Um, I, mean, I, I don't think HA can notify you if HA is not online. No, but I use the uptime robot. Actually free if you yeah. want to use it and it can integrate as well. Not it's very useful to integrate the system you're monitoring, but it can. I did, don't know why, but 
it, it's actually yeah. darn fast. Like it's free and it sends me an S and like a text message in a couple of seconds after my home system went down. Even if I do like upgrade or my system does reasonably fast, it will just send me up and down notifications. That's good. Yeah. So are there any like bigger questions like we can wind up with? Yeah, I mean, we gotta pick a, gotta catch a train. Yeah, that's for sure. So, some last questions look like a good idea. Like, you can ask me questions all the time. So, maybe, uh, Ram or Paul. You questions. should have a fireplace notification. Yeah. I actually thought about how, how I could do something with a fireplace, but I'm not sure. I don't know. Do you wanna, like, put, like, some ignition API? Like just light the fire when you're not there. I want to know if it's on or not. That would be oh, helpful yeah. for for like I don't know, like your temperature, temperature sensor or right or your thermostat. No, that's true. So that would be cool. What are you most excited about releasing in the future? 1.0. 1.0. Yeah, I mean it's this is like the thing has been going on for a while, but like we really want to we are keep making it easier to use and really having like. You know, thinking through the different concepts and how it's presented to the user, and we want to get it to a place where we feel like this is good, and this is what we want to call 1.0. And I think we're we're making a lot of progress, and I think you know, within like the next six months, we're gonna get there. Um, yeah. Definitely now that like Frank and Brahma just like full focus on it. <laughs> yeah. On your shoulders. Man. No pressure. No, no, no but I think no that, like, yeah. <sighs> It'll be, it'll be good. It's, uh, I think that's the thing I'm most excited about is getting like to a level where like if you get put in front of like a home assistant instance, like onboarding everything, like it just makes sense and you can just, you know, use it to do basic stuff. We'll get there. Somebody's saying, come on, fuck it, like every 10 <laughs> seconds. I'm pretty sure we'll be there. <laughs> There it is. Here we go. Oh, you go. Good. Yeah. The magic. The fire. It's burning. <laughs> so when is 1.0 released? Oh, we don't know. A new version is going to be 1.01. No, we we start with three zeros. I think <laughs> that would be helpful. Yeah. No, I mean 1.01. Oh, oh. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll see how we're gonna do versioning after that. Uh, yeah. What do you think about using Home Assistant in a professional environment like after school? I actually know a place in the Netherlands where uh, they manage a whole like, park, like in a nature uh, fauna park, with Home Assistant. Like it's That's a big, cool. huge. It's really it's huge, and they have uh, like a lot of trees and visitor centers, and uh, they measure uh, ground moisture everywhere and it's it i've seen the installation it's really huge I, and it was really cool to see they even developed like devices that go deep in the ground and plug like oh that's water cool and stuff yeah, nice uh, that, that's really nice when will we physically do that i have some pictures of uh, of the uh, of the ui it's kind of nice but I, do, I have know, a do you have a green theme no it wasn't a green theme oh man but you, you could see <laughs> they had they had like a few with a map of the park it was like a big park. You can go there oh, actually as a visitor, and, and, and they have all kinds of cameras. And it, it was really nice to see. So I think it's cool what people come up with. It. Some people put it in RV. Some people on a boat. I so know. I mean, it, really yeah. I mean, there was a guy who put it in a brewery. I was listening to the Home Assistant yeah. podcast. Yeah. Brewery even. So or an office or a school. Oh yeah, I manage a brick factory. There you go. So, so yeah, you can use it in a professional environment. Why not? Cool. Brick factory. Huh. That's cool. Check out that fire. Yeah. <laughs> He's happy go. now. There you go. <laughs> Just buy an electric fire. No. No, this is better. This is like 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 chopping wood and, and doing the man thing and cleaning it up the next day. <laughs> so much fun. I would just I, electric is I don't like it, but I have like gas powered or was kind of chill. You put it on, put it off. But I mean, I, I like the wood more just because it like 
It smells a bit. It has like. It makes it crackling sound. Yeah. Right. That's, I used to have the Netflix. Uh, they have this wood log fire. Like. <laughs> it has a crackling <laughs> sound, but it doesn't have the smell <laughs> and experience. But. Uh, hey, that's all we can do in California. That's like. It's always dry. Right. Right. Yeah. Of, uh, natural fires outside. Right. Yeah. Have you come up with an automation with the issue you tweeted about your little boy running from the crib? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> Doing the man thing, chopping wood, having the wife deliver wine. Guess so. Okay. So. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's call it. Let's call it, right? Yes. So guys, thank you for watching. Hope to see you next time. Choo-choo. And... I would say have a good holiday season. Yeah, good um, holiday season. That's release sure. is tomorrow, and after that, we're gonna be on a break till uh, we'll be back January eighth with a new beta. So January fourteenth ish. Yeah, some casual hot fixes maybe in between. You know, nah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. So we no, try no not to. Right? <laughs> yeah. So thanks awesome. for watching. Yeah. Yeah. And, and have uh, a jolly holiday. Yeah. Season. All right. Bye, bye.